Hello, welcome back. Got sort of a little bonus episode here, not going up at the normal time, but I was too excited to wait because uh, I found a solution for sig uh, sequence mode calculator. So I thought about this for a little while. This is my failed attempt that didn't go anywhere, right? Yeah, this had all the unrolled loops and stuff. The one where I misread the spec several times in a row and didn't know what to do. So I thought about this a little bit. Um, I sometimes feel kind of bad about putting up like an hour, 40 minutes of video where I don't get a puzzle done. But I think showing the full process here is kind of important. Um, if I just like said, oh, I need to figure out how to do this puzzle, uh, then went off on my own and like explained what I had done, you would miss a lot of the intermediate steps. And um, one of the things that I think is cool about this series, I hope, um, kind of a goal that I have is to show anybody who's watching, um, kind of to demystify programming a bit for them. If like, if you're a non-programmer and are interested in it, um, I just want to show that like, you know, you can make all the logical deductions yourself. It's not this weird black magic thing. So by showing the full process of all my blunders that I make, um, hopefully I can just look like a normal person who's going through a process that looks like you could also do it too. Anyway, so that's kind of my, a, a little bit of my philosophy behind why I would do that. However, um, I did decide to go off on my own and come up with a real solution to this just because the process for that, um, I had to invent some new, uh, new processes and I didn't know how well they would work. So anyway, I'll click on this, um, you know, feel free to look over the code, but I'll, I'll explain it in, in detail as I go. So this was the first time uh, this program was written almost entirely outside of TIS-100, just in a text document. Um, what's nice about this instruction set is it's small enough and simple enough that I don't actually really have to execute it to, um, to understand what it's doing. I do to debug it. I did have to import this and make a bunch of changes to debug it and tweak and stuff. Uh, but anyway, this was the first puzzle where I found it useful to actually write, so conceptualize a solution, write it out in a high-level pseudo-language, and then translate that into machine code. So um, I have, you know, a C-like implementation of this program, and that helped me figure out for one thing, you know, I checked it against the spec, and it's a lot less code, a lot more expressive, easier to understand um, what I'm actually trying to do. So I got that correct for my interpretation of the spec, just for the logic then uh, figured out how to fit it into these nodes with all the spatial constraints and everything. So uh, fundamentally, this is not entirely dissimilar to this. So let's see, how did this process go? I first had the idea that like, uh, initialize this with five values with a negative one terminator on it and ping pong these back and forth, adding one uh, as they flow along the thing to uh, to count whichever value is coming in, then do some kind of processing on that to figure out uh, what the max is. So several things went wrong. Uh, I misread the spec twice. And um, my first attempt used a lot of space just for, um, it used like these five nodes just for the initial initialization and um, shuffling things around. Well, actually, yeah, uh, this, this node had one instruction in it, but mostly it used a lot of stuff in all five of those. So by the time I had, you know, added up my, my stuff in the stack, uh, I had only this node and most of this node to actually do any kind of meaningful calculations with it. And then that's when I didn't properly think of what those calculations were. But anyway, so thinking about this in a high level language, I realized that, um, I found a way to, if I, during this, pro well, actually, the first thing I did was I thought, you know, I used way too many nodes for that. What if I could come back to, down to just like these three nodes for, um, for shuffling the stuff around and doing the counting? And I, I managed to do that. So I fit all of that logic into the, these three. Then I would have all four of these nodes for the rest of my stuff. So this one is an interesting case. I'll go through this in detail in a moment anyway, um, but what this node actually does is it calculates the maximum, the, the highest value in the stack. So if I, I realize that if I know that value ahead of time, I can just iterate through this once and then figure out the answer from that. 
So let's go through this in detail. I'm using the jrow command a whole lot. This is like my favorite command now. I remember it wasn't too long ago that I was like, huh, I used that once, it was kind of cool, maybe I should use it more. Now it's like the best thing and I use it everywhere. Every one of these nodes except one has a jrow in it, which is the one that doesn't. So there's that one, here's this one, here's this one, here's this one. Do you have one? You do. Do you have one? Okay, you're the only one without that. <laughs> All of the other nodes listen to their neighbors for commands for where to go next. And it's just so much more compact to do that, and you don't have to like take up a register and do a bunch of branches and conditionals. Anyway, it's, it's the best. So, um, initialization. I put five into the accumulator and... Oh, actually, no, the first initialization is here. So this command executes first. Uh, these two actually collaborate to initialize this. I was at 16 instructions in this. An advantage of writing a program like this in a text document is that I can uh, type more than the 15 instructions that'll fit and then compact it down later. That's probably the main advantage. Anyway, so I had 16 instructions here. I managed to move uh, the initial negative one insertion from here to here. So this initializes the, the marker at the end. This puts five in the accumulator and adds one every time, um, uh, yeah, loops until this reaches zero. So this is four instructions that uh, does the same task as those five instructions, the unrolled loop I had over here, uh, this guy. So I save one instruction per time that I need to do a thing that looks like this if I do it in that pattern. So it feels kind of important that it's five values here. Um, it could be more. Since I don't have any unrolled loops anymore, I don't think there's anything fundamental to five values here that uh, would require me to change my program if it was a different number. Yeah, so this should adapt if I would change a couple of constants here and there. Uh, would adapt to a different, different numbers of numbers. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... By the way, I've already yeah, input this and debugged it and verified that it at least outputs about that many correctly. I don't know that, you know, test two and random test pass. I haven't run this all the way through, but let's walk through it. So anyway, initialize, um, put five in there and initialize. So just, this is a for loop of five, five times do this. Uh, and then it reads the first input value and puts it down here. So this was waiting for that. Um, by the way, this is waiting for something from the right. Um, the general flow of this, like I said, was this is the communicator that initializes, other than this little help here, uh, empties this stack and puts it down here, and this node also empties this stack and puts it back in here. That's a lot of tasks for 15 instructions, but I did make it fit. Uh, this node, how would I describe what you do at a high level overview? Um, you determine, you keep track of which index is flowing through here and instruct this node when you are at the, the index of the input uh, in the stack to add one to the, the value as it flows through here. So again, fundamentally the same as my other program, you know, Read that input, subtract it until you hit zero, do a jez, add one on that jez, and insert an one extra value. Oh, you might notice I'm initializing this with ones instead of um, zeros. So the numbers you'll see in here are one more than whatever. So a one in here means there are zero of that number. A two means there's one of them. It's just so that I can use jigs uh, because there's no jigez. <laughs> I can't uh, jump greater than or equal to and Jules has different implications. So yeah, I just start at one, um, and that works better. Okay, so yeah, then you, your job is to flow this through here, add one to it when told to. Uh, that's where you add one in the flow to, to count the digits. And your additional job is to communicate to this node. So this one keeps track of the max value. This is like the logic 
that I was trying to squeeze into this tiny little tight space here or here. Yeah, so I have the new max there. So yeah, these were trying to figure out what the max value was. Then my logic just didn't work out. But anyway, uh, it actually works here. So yeah, you just keep track of a number. Uh, you start at uh, zero. Yeah, this will make sense eventually. You start at zero. And when you get a value from here that's higher than the one you have saved away, you uh, set that as your, your current value. Then when I'm done with, when I, when I hit a zero, uh, in the zero case, you spit that value back up here, and it flows all the way over to here. And then these nodes uh, do the calculation of, so this, this node empties this Q uh, stack, and moves it down here and makes sure that this node gets the, you know, each value as it comes enough times. Or no, it actually calculate it, it sends both each value as it comes through and repeats the max value that I had read from here. So then for each one of those, you check to see if the digit that's flowing through the index that's flowing through is one with the max value. If it is, you tell this one about it, and it prepares to say that that, um, uh, that index is going to be its output. However, this puts itself into a different mode after it's told you that the first time. And if again it hits the max value, this is why I want to know it ahead of time, so I can just watch for that one specific value. Uh, if it again hits the max value, then you say to this, oh, I found two of them, therefore there's a tie, and you actually want to send a zero instead. That was one of the most interesting things to implement here. Okay, so let's go through it in detail. You know what, let's actually step. So I've described this already. Uh, you initialize that immediately. Ooh, wow, that's almost a race, but you take a moment to put that into the port before it propagates there. Yeah, there's like a one instruction space between I.O. operations. Uh, so I don't think this is actually a race condition. The negative one makes it in there. Uh, uh, negative one makes it in there before, um, before this one, these ones start flowing in. All right, so everybody down here is just waiting on a message. So you put five ones in there, this hits zero, and now you go to, uh, you stop going to init. All right. So read the two, put it down here. Then you're going to wait for this to tell you where to go. All right. The two is not a zero, so skip over that. Uh, I'm going to tell you to go here to what I'm calling inner. So inner loop is the loop through the stack node. Outer loop is the loop through, like, this whole list, basically. Uh, I had more informative labels in, right, another benefit of writing this in a, in a text editor is greater width. One, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 columns is very restrictive. Um, sometimes as restrictive as 15 rows. Anyway, uh, so right, you're waiting for an instruction and you're giving one. So I want to do the inner loop. This is telling you, start pulling values out of here and sending them to me. Uh, right, and this continues doing that until it hits the negative one at the end. So once you start that loop, it's just going to empty this fully. All right, so then you wait for a value. You pull it into the accumulator, move the accumulator down. The reason I go via your register is so I can do this jugs to keep the loop going. All right, so you get that, then you're just gonna continue doing that until uh, this condition fails when you get the negative one, and you'll jump back here to wait for the J row. Okay, so you pulled the first value, which was a one, which means zero, <laughs> uh, out of there and gave it to this. So this is going to pass it on to there after potentially um, uh, potentially adding one to it. Don't mind this jazz for now. This was one of the last changes I made. So it was real hard, like cramming the last little bit of logic in here when I was doing my debugging and realized I needed things to work a bit differently. 
yeah, this was one of the last instructions I added. Uh, I'll explain it when we get there. Uh, I think the zero is your signal to, that's the end of the outer loop? I forget. Anyway, it'll make sense. So right, you have a two in your register because you read it on your first instruction. That was what came in from in. So you're gonna continually subtract from it so that you will know when you've hit the index being talked about in this list. So if you have hit that index, then you say to add one. Should look familiar. I went through all this plenty. You're waiting for an instruction of where to go. Uh, so it'll either tell you, skip over that add and just put that in, or um, if add one happens, then it'll say, don't skip the add, jump to the very next instruction, add one, then move it up. This is very similar to the technique I learned from... Um, uh, what, what was it called? Um, what was the name of the... Slavak, yeah. Uh, it wasn't Slavak that I learned this from, though, was it? Yes, it was. Yeah, this guy. This guy taught me something. Um, I'm using something like that. Anyway, J. Rowe is the best thing. <laughs> uh, right. So where was I? You go in there. You've initialized. You move that down. And right, you jump over the add one. So move to... So you didn't add one, you're going to move it up, and then... Right, you always move it up, even if it is a negative one. Right, yeah, so this jez, this is one of the reasons these are ones instead of zeros, so that I can do an exactly zero. Um, actually, this just happened to work out. I had already changed those to ones, but zero is sort of a unique value that can come in here and tell you something different from... Uh, you know, all of these values go through, whether they're positive or negative, but if they're zero, they don't. Anyway, so positive numbers and negative ones do all make it in here, because my marker actually comes along um, so that I know where it is. Anyway, uh, so you... Oh, interesting. I'm just noticing uh, a behavior I didn't actually realize before is this marker goes to the other side of that stack and you just count to six when emptying it. So it doesn't even look for that marker in this stack, but it does make its way back in here, back at the bottom again. Okay, so anyway, uh, you didn't add one, you're moving it up, great. Uh, you are going to ask this node what to do, why? Because you do not know about the value that flowed through you, the value that was pulled out of this stack. But why do you need to know about that? I guess you need to know whether it's negative one. Yeah, that's what this Jules is about. So when you hit the negative one, you go to end and tell this to continue up there. Okay, we'll do that when we get to it. If you don't, you go back to the inner loop. So this is sort of a convention I was using whenever it fits. I'd put a comment here whenever I moved something that's that has a J row destination, and I would try to have a matching label there. Uh, so it's like a like a labeled go to kind of. Unfortunately, this comment doesn't always fit. Again, eighteen columns, not very many. Okay, so uh, you're continuing the inner loop. You moved a value and did not add to it. Good for you. Also, you have a value. The value is one. Um, let's see, you'll get stalled there until you're ready to accept another input. But now this node wakes up. Uh, you did some initialization that doesn't actually do anything on this first pass, but it will on later ones. And wait for instruction from you. So I want to go to comp compare. Uh, so you're going to subtract this value that came through here which would have already had the one added to it by this time if it was going to be added to. So the value that, the new value of count of that particular index uh, gets subtracted, um, comparing it to your current maximum value. If it's less than zero, meaning the new one coming in was greater than what you had, which it was because the old one was zero, then you got new max, which just reads the same value again, and sticks it in your back buffer. 
uh, and then goes back to your loop. Just waits for this. Okay, right, so you swap and save. Yeah, so you did some stuff with your front buffer. Um, now I want to save that in the back buffer. Actually, no. Okay, so this is still kind of confusing. Um, front and back buffer go... Yes, front and back buffer go both get the same thing. Because the back buffer is the known correct maximum. The front buffer is the one that's operated on to compare and see if you have a new one. So yeah, the save, swap, then save is how to set both back and act to the same value. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is doing. All right, so you are done with that part. You go back here, you're ready to finish with, uh, you're ready to continue with this business. Great. So then that just proceeds the same way. Uh, Jez add one. Okay, so we're adding one. I got a two, so the second one is getting added to. Uh, just as I said, this moves a one over here instead of a two, so that you add one before you do the rest of your operations. And then you land at the same line. Right, so I had that problem earlier in my other program where I wanted to do a J-row, but I had a whole bunch. Um, I had like three different J-rows, so I didn't know which index I was jumping to. I think I did actually solve it there, but the way to solve that is replace all of them with a jump. There is no reason to ever have more than one J-row in a program. You just have a label before it and replace everywhere else you want it to jump to that label. That way you're always... Um, add a known instruction offset, like if different uh, things can come in here. There probably is a reason somewhere, sometime, to do two different J-rows. <laughs> like if you're talking to do different nodes for, um, for things, but no, I feel like you would really always want exactly one. Hmm, okay, yeah, so only one per node. Uh, makes sense to me at this point, at least. So anyway, where, where am I? You're adding one. You're waiting for instruction from you. This proceeds as normal. You add one, uh, two becomes the new max because uh, it's greater than one. So write you sub up, you get negative one. Read this, replace it with two, save it there. Swap save just in case you... Huh. It's possible I might be able to optimize out some of this. Maybe not though. I think those needed to be there for something. There was a reason I added these two instructions. I think it has to do with like not hitting new max. Yeah, if I don't hit new max, um, yeah, then you just discard the incoming uh, thing that might have wanted to be set. And at that point, this will be some mangled value. Yeah, so this refreshes ack with the value of back and then puts it back into the back buffer again. Um, yeah, so technically from new max, you could jump straight to this instruction, which would never save you anything because this will never send you a new value so quickly that these two wouldn't have had time to execute. But it might be a bit cleaner. Yeah, I should change this jump loop to jump uh, wait and put a wait label on there. I'm gonna dare to actually make that change. This is playing with fire, but that's what I'm doing. I think that is what I wanna do. Okay. So right, I step to the point of, ooh, that's noisy when I hold the button. Anyway, so we get a two in there, it jumps to wait, and that's great. You have the twos. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, let's just go ahead and empty this all the way out. So it puts all those in there. Negative one's coming in. Okay, so negative one's going here. Uh, you still have the negative one, so you don't do that, so now you go to wait. Great. Uh... You're still processing the one, so you're waiting for that. You're waiting for this. You're doing new max stuff. Great. Uh, you read the negative one coming in, moving you on. You're still subtracting because you're still counting. You do actually count to six, basically. <laughs> what, this doesn't look like six to you? <laughs> uh, so then you, right, uh, you don't add because that's not the index. Anyway, uh, it's not zero. 
You want to jump past the and, you put the negative one in, you're waiting for instruction. Okay, so JLZ end, so here's where different things happen. Uh, you tell this to proceed up to empty. So empty here, right, this is another this convention. Uh, I'm J-rowing from here to this label here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, yes. Uh, then you're ready to just go back to your loop. You're done with your work until more stuff comes in there. Right. Um, and you kind of same. Okay, so we went through one iteration of emptying that in here. So now you uh, count to six in exactly the same manner as this counted to five on init. So you count to six, pull that out and put it in there. L3 means loop three. Okay, so you did it, you counted to six, and now you don't want to init again yet. You wanna to go to this, pull another value, because you you haven't hit a zero yet. And the process repeats itself. Right, and you'll keep checking the new max until uh, until stuff happens. All right, how can I do this reasonably? Let's just let this run. I'll try to catch it when we get to that zero. So yeah, you're just doing your job. I'll watch for when this turn, okay, so this is about to turn to zero. All right, so that emptied. These are the counts. Four, one, two, two, two. Actually, what the, that actually is is one, 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 zero, three. <laughs> There are three fives, uh, one, 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 two, one, three, and zero fours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you move the zero down here, jazz end, and moves a zero over here. Okay, so I could move ack right, and it would have the same value, but you know, it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, Right, so the special value of zero I can detect because it will zero will never come in from, from here. Uh, you want to read something from right. Yeah, you want to read the max that was calculated here. So in end two, you tell this to offset by eight. So I couldn't fit a label in there, but this goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, goes to reset. Uh, move that value up. So that four goes up here, goes over there, uh, and then you reset and save. Mm -hmm. Goes over there, you're waiting for this. Okay, and you're about to complete that. So finally you get to wake up, Mr. 99% idle. All right, and you go back there, you're all initialized to zero. Oh, so this could also jump to wait, but that would be an extra instruction, so it shouldn't and this will not affect my cycle count. Okay, uh, anyway, so, um, so right, you're starting to do work finally. This, uh, this is essentially just waiting on this, but also uh, I had to move left to up. You're waiting for a J row. I couldn't fit another move here to tell you what instruction to do, so I had to, had to pull from the left. Uh, it's gonna be this one, I believe, this negative five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so that'll take you back to init when you're done with your work. Anyway, yeah. So it pulls this and in, this instruction offset all the way from there up there. But the also the point of this is to have this node wait until this one has finished its work. All right. So uh, save that four because you're going to need it multiple times. Pull a value out of the stack. Put that value down here. Wait, no, put it in here, actually. Uh, if it's negative one, you're done, but it's not. So then here's a, okay, so you move one into ack already. Yeah, and you swap. Okay, so you moved one into your back buffer. I'll tell you what that one means. That's a very, very, very important one. That's like the most important number in this entire program. Uh, so you move one down, so that's instruction offset, just proceed with your work. Uh, your work is to read the value that you've pulled out of the stack into here. 
So that's the value of a digit. You don't know which digit, but you do. So this is the one that counts to five, uh, keeping track of which uh, index is being talked about here. So it currently has one in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it moved zero, then added one. Okay. Uh, so you are, so you have saved, you saved the two. Then you're going to subtract the max. You're going to send your max, which is in your back buffer. So you just swap, move it down, then swap. So you're red. So the max stays safely in there. Uh, so you subtract that to compare to see if the count for the current index matches the max count. It does not because it's negative two. It's not the the jazz doesn't go off. Uh, right. So then you're going to go to loop and pull another of those. Um, so then you, so you move negative one, uh, nothing is really happening here. You just want to count to the next index because this was not the one we're interested in. You jump to the loop and pull another value. You jump to your loop and pull another value or well, wait for instruction. Okay. So then this proceeds. So two, two has a count of one, which is represented as two. Uh, the same thing's gonna happen. You'll sub up, you'll get negative two, you won't found match. You'll tell this to just add one and proceed. That'll keep on happening until I get to five, which has a four in it, which means three. <laughs> you with me still? <laughs> uh, Anyway, yeah, so we do this. Um, I mean, this will be a slightly different value. This will now get negative three. Anyway, so finally you get the last value here. So you get a four, you subtract four from it, giving you zero. So you found match, finally. Um, so you're going to swap out that one, the most important value in the entire program and send that to the right as the operand for j row. So that tells you to go to found match. And then what you do here, uh, don't mind what's happening here, it's just getting the negative one. Well, sure, let's do this before I interactively step through that. So you get the negative one, you go there and you want to move a 10 down. That looks like an instruction offset. Okay, so you'll just land there. You want to tell this to go from here to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to done. But what you're doing is now that you've moved that 1 over here, you change it. You instead assign 3 to that value and go back to your loop. So this is your mode switch. You have said, I've already emitted an index. I think it's this index. This matches the max count. But now I have a 3 in me. If I hit the max count again, you will get a different instruction offset, which means it's a tie instead of it's a good index, and that'll go down a different code path, and that's how I get the zero output for the ties. <laughs> I'm proud of that one. I really like that, that part of this program. Anyway, cool. So, um, tens coming in, that's your instruction offset. Uh, you're not doing anything interesting. Right, so move six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So now you're done. And you just read your back buffer and write it to down. And uh, you're doing some stuff. You're just reinitializing. Oh yeah, and this has already started its init. Right, the negative five made it in here and went here and started your init over. Okay, great. So that's how it works. And it does its job and it's beautiful. So I looked at the graph for this program, and annoyingly, some people have somehow done five node solutions. When I was struggling this hard to <laughs> cram my stuff into seven nodes. How could anyone ever do this in five nodes? I don't understand. All right, um, so the first zero expected output is coming. Is this, you have a 432, it's not yet. Wait, it is, 432. 432. Oh yeah, of course, you have a tie because they are all ones, as in all twos. Uh, where are you in the cycle right now? 
Are you still counting? The zero's about to come in. So right, what I want to watch is this happen. So found match. Did you find a match? No, there were zero ones, but there is one two, represented by a two here. All right, so you're gonna get found match. So then you swap the one in, you move it there. So this says, I think the index is two. Uh, that's the best one I have so far. However, this now has three in here. It gets another match. And now you get a three, so it's a tie. Okay, now I think um, that it's actually zero. And tie can happen multiple times. It will here. This is a three-way tie. Uh, so you'll jump back here. It'll found a match again. Uh, three is still in there. It was rewritten to it. That's fine. This will rewrite the zero here. That's fine. And then when you get to the end, it outputs a zero. And it's perfect. And that's my entire program. I'm very proud of this one. Yeah, I ran it about to this point just to make sure the zero and everything worked. And, uh, barring some weird edge case that this somehow exercises or like test set two will exercise, I'm pretty sure that is a complete program. I wish I could run a little bit faster than this, but not at max speed. Because if I run at max speed, you're just not going to be able to see what happens. Let's try. Well, actually you are. Whoa. Okay. Well, I missed test set two. Test set three, random test. Oh no, my cycle count is way above average. My instruction count is below average though. Huh, so there was a much faster way to do that. Interesting. I didn't expect this. I expected somewhere around like here-ish. Huh. Okay, so what that's going to be is almost certainly just in the fundamental approach to the algorithm. So what I basically did was I used the first thing I came up with, found it didn't work, made a small um, evolutionary change to it, implemented it, crammed it into this tight little space, and then used the first uh, working solution. So the existence of five node solutions and the fact that my cycle count is about three times average tells me that my fundamental algorithm is not the dominant one here and that the dominant one is significantly faster. This, this, and this are all almost certainly the same solution. I wonder how many of those are like somebody Googled the answer to this and copy pasted it in. <laughs> I suspect that will have some effect on the graph. Like some people will just say, eh, this one's too hard for me. Let me just, just take somebody else's answer. But why would you do that? Like, you're just like skipping the entire game experience if you do that. But I'll bet some people have done it. Anyway, okay. Um, now, I, I guess now I kind of want to do it. Well, now is the time after I've come up with a solution. So I'd like to learn from other people's solution. Also, yes, apparently this is a very notorious puzzle. Um, perhaps as much as a uh, sequence sorter for the people who got that far in the game. Anyway, cool. So proud of my solution, even though it's slow. Uh, I just want to watch that again because I like it. <laughs> it doesn't look that slow on fast, but fast, like I said, usually just goes so fast you can't even see what's happening. Okay, great. So anyway, proud of that solution. Uh, was proud enough that I decided I had to do this today instead of waiting for the normal time. Uh, we we'll are back to normal next time with Sequence Normalizer. <laughs> How appropriate. I'll see you then.